Hello everyone and welcome to the very first video on this channel. I thought that over the next few weeks I would um, drop some content regarding the UCAT and some of the things which helped me to be able to score in the top 0.1 percentile um, of the UCAT and I thought what better way than to start off with syllogisms in decision making which is one of the most tough topics notoriously amongst students. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a technique which I really which I found to be really really helpful during my time and that many other students have also found to be helpful but to, before to begin with I'm just going to go over some of the base ideas of syllogisms um, and then we'll kind of go on from that okay so to begin with the idea of syllogisms is that it there will be a set of premises that are given to you and based upon those premises you have to decide if the following statements are true or not so firstly the important idea is that you can't make any outside inferences you can't use any of your own knowledge as such all you can use is the information given to you in the premise you can't make any assumptions or anything like that okay secondly it's really really important to get to grips with the definitions of words and whilst these words may seem common to you the UCAT has very, very specific definitions, which you can find if you go to the official UCAT website um, and you go to, so all you have to do is go to YouTube, uh, go to Google, type in UCAT Pearson um, at Excel, and then you can go to the website, go to their preparation tools, resources, and then you'll find that there's a PowerPoint um, covering each of the sections. And in the decision making section, there will be one of the slides on the PowerPoint details, all of the important definitions. So I'm gonna go over some of these here with you today just because they're really, really crucial to understand. And this is one of the common pitfalls for students as to why they get questions wrong. So to begin with, the first um, really important definition is sum. OK, so sum has is defined as basically, if you think about it from a scale of one to 100 or not to 100, sum is two to 99. OK, so it's more than one, but not all. So it's somewhere in that range. Many is the majority, but not all. So you can think of it as 51 to 99. Few is basically 49 or less, but still some, if that means. so still at least one. So I guess one to 49. And then there's some others you can think about as well. So another really important definition is or, okay? Or is important because if a statement is, um, if you get any statements with or in it, so there are some really easy ways to disprove them, which I will show you later on. But or basically means that only one of the two can be correct. And I know that seems really obvious, but there's a point as to why I'm mentioning this. So if I say my hair is black or brown, that means it's one of the two. It can't be both and it can't be neither. Okay, so that's a little bit of a, of a, of a hint as to what we're about to get onto. And the last one, which I haven't written down here, which is also important, is not all. So not all means one to 99. The reason why this is important is because one of the most important um, kind of interchanges that occurs is between not all and some, which you can't always do. So if I tell you not all my bananas are black, that might mean I only have one black banana. OK, so if that's in the premise and then imagine in my statements, if it said some of my bananas are black, I unfortunately wouldn't be able to conclude that because, as we mentioned earlier, some is two to ninety nine. OK, so, um, yeah, so like I said, I only put some of the most more common definitions. There are some others as well, which you can find, like I said, yourself, if you go to um, go to go to Google and go to their website. I will also put a link um, in the description of this video as well. The third thing that's really, really important is to be able to use um, common tricks, okay? Or I say use, be able to understand common tricks. So one of the most common tricks is um, when they say, if A, then B, okay? But that doesn't necessarily mean if B, then A. And other things are things like all, think about it this way, all crows are birds, but that doesn't mean all birds are crows, okay? So think about which way the information is going. And like, as, as I said, this will all make more sense when you see my method and you see about um, the, the ways in which I do it to try and make it as simple as, simple as possible. The other thing is, lack of information. So one of the things I haven't really discussed is actually understanding what the terms yes and no mean. Okay, so when we go onto the questions, you'll see that you're meant to put yes or no for the following statements. Yes means that the statement logically follows. The no, me no means that there is either a direct contradiction, okay, so something in the original premise contradicts our statement, or there's simply not enough information. In a lot of cases, there's simply not enough information. There's not enough um, information given to kind of correlate two ideas. Um, and you'll see that in some of the questions that we come on to do. And fourthly, OK, so just kind of uh, piggybacking on this idea of what the yes and no means. One of the common ways I use to kind of decipher if a question is yes or no is this idea of creating a hypothetical situation. OK, so what that basically means is, is think about it this way. So, you know, for example. So if I write a statement here. 
4 is an odd number. Okay? So most of you right now are screaming at the screen saying, yeah, that's wrong. We know that's wrong. Okay? So, okay, that's fine. But imagine if for some reason you didn't know what an odd number was, but you knew what an even number was. And so you made this number, so you made this the opposite. So you said 4 is an even number. So you know that the opposite statement is true, so therefore your original statement must be false. Does that make sense? So that's the kind of idea I'm trying to get at. So whenever they give you a statement, if you can amend the statement, so if it says some of my bananas are black, and you can create a hypothetical situation with all of the information given to you in the premise, where let's say none of the bananas are black, then your original statement of some of the bananas are black must be false. OK, so this idea of creating the hypothetical is really, really important to get into. And perhaps in the future, I'll make more specific videos talking about it. But for now, I think it's important for us to get into our examples so you can kind of use this technique and um, hopefully um, this will be helpful. OK, so let's move on to our very first question. So the first question um, is quite a nice one. I've chosen quite a nice one just so I can demonstrate my technique. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through two other examples that are different styles of syllogism questions, showing you how my example can be used for each of them. Okay? So, first of all, I guess the, 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 the easiest way to explain my method is just to kind of, I'll describe it a little bit, but then I'll just walk through you through the question. And then for future questions, you guys can have a go. So you can pause the screen and have a go. So my method is basically the arrow method, and it, it's nothing too complicated, but the important idea is when you're first practicing, the difficulty will be in getting your diagrams down. But then as you get good at it, what will happen is that it's the comprehension idea that, you know, you'll kind of struggle with a little bit. But that's natural. It's totally normal. But with enough practice, you'll be able to get there. So the whole idea of using a diagram is important because it means that you're essentially simplifying the information. Because especially in the pressure of the exam, if you read to words over and over again, sentences over and over again. And this is quite a short syllogism question. They're often much, much longer. It's very, very easy to get yourself confused. So what I simply do is I use arrows to substitute for the words. And it's really, really important to come up with your own key. So the key that I have is nothing crazy. It's an arrow with nothing on it means all. An arrow with a cross means on it means none or zero, etc, etc. Some people like to use really extravagant kind of scenarios like, oh, this means sum or whatever. But I just like to keep it simple. If I ever get something that's not one of those two, I'll just write on it. So sum. OK, so if it said sum of my bananas are black, I'll just put sum here like this. OK, so let's start off with this then. So skinks and iguanas are two different types of lizard. So skink is a lizard and iguana is a lizard. And I always like to draw the arrow in the direction of the speech. So a skink is a type of lizard. Does that make sense? So skinks and iguanas are two different types of lizard. All devours your skinks, okay, and all lizards are reptiles. Okay, so I've got my diagram. And you can see how much easier it is to have a look at this and visualise it compared to um, having to reread the text over and over again. Like, I can glance at this and I can kind of understand everything that's going on. And I know what a lot of you are thinking, okay, this is great, this technique works for questions like this where it's about lineages, but what about for other questions? So what I'm going to do in future videos is show you, and also in the other examples later on in this video, that this technique is apl applicable universally. You can use this for any syllogism question. Okay, so let's go through it. No lizards are skinks. Well, you can see skinks are lizards. So therefore, you can't conclude that no lizards are skinks because we know skinks are lizards. Okay, all Davazi are reptiles. You can see all Davazi are skinks, all skinks are lizards, and all lizards are reptiles. And so if we follow this along, this must be true. No Davazi or iguanas. So you can see all Davazi are skinks, we said this. And remember, skinks and iguanas are two different types of lizards. We know they're two separate arrows. So this is true. No Davazi or iguanas. Some reptiles are skinks. So you can see skinks are lizards and lizards are reptiles. And so therefore we're able to conclude that some reptiles are skinks. And lastly, all skinks are Davazi. So this is why it's crucial to get the direction of the arrow right. OK, because our arrow says all Davazi or skinks, but it doesn't say all skinks are Davazi. OK, remember what I said, all crows are birds. That doesn't mean all birds are crows. And this is one of those common tricks that we talked about, the whole ABBA kind of idea. And it's very easy to identify from our passage here, um, fr from the diagram here. OK, cool. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go on to the next example. If any of you would like to have a go at trying to make a diagram yourself, maybe you can pause the video right now. Okay, see if you can get a diagram, maybe even if you can get five answers, 
and then unpause it. And what I'll do is I will go through the answers and I will also draw my diagram. OK. Cool. OK, so let's have a look at this. In a car park, there are 50 vehicles, of which 30 are cars and the rest are vans. That means there's 20 vans. Half of the cars are blue, half of the cars are red, but none of the red vehicles are vans. OK, so what I've done is once again, so this time my hours are going down because that's just the way the speech was so in a car park. There are 30 cars and the rest are vans, etc, etc. OK, it doesn't really matter what like it doesn't matter in general if my arrows are up or down, but it's more about, like I said, getting them in the direction of the speech. And you can see once again, it's very, very easy to interpret this. OK, um, cool. Let's have a look at the questions. Some of the vans are blue. Well, if you have a look on the van side, it says that none of them are red and we have 20 vans, but we don't know anything about the colours. OK, remember what I said, a, an answer of yes means that you have to be able to conclude it definitively. You basically have to be able to put your life on. It, OK, and here you can't. OK, it could be. Remember what I said, and this is where the hypothetical thing comes. It could be that all of the vans are blue. OK, it could be that none of the vans are blue. It could be that all of the vans are orange. It could be that all of the vans are pink. It could be that all of the vans are brown, black, as long as it's not red, right? That's the only thing we're taught, none of them are red. And so because of this idea of what I was saying about making the opposite true, you know, creating the hypothetical, this first one has to be false. The only red vehicles are cars, okay? So we know that there's cars and vans and none of the vans are red, so this must be true. All of the vans are blue or white, once again. All we know is that none of them are red. We don't know any other information about them. So these two are wrong for the same reason. OK, so these two are no for the same reason. OK, so there are more blue cars than blue vans. OK, this one is also no. And the reason why this one is no is not necessarily only because we don't know how many vans there are that are blue, but it's also because there's a possibility that there could be 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 or 20 blue vans. OK, so what do I mean by that? Well, what I'm trying to get at here is imagine we had the exact same question, but we changed the number of vans to 10 now. OK, just just imagine I'm, I'm just changing the question. If we change the number of vans to 10, our answer actually becomes yes. OK, our answer actually becomes yes instead of no. And that's because if we had 10 vans, there would still be 15 blue cars. And so there's no way there can be more blue vans than cars. And so therefore, our statement would have to be true. OK, so the point that I'm trying to raise there is that you don't necessarily need to always have exact information to be able to conclude an answer. OK, sometimes absence of information can also lead to information. So here, the, the, the important idea is that the statement is false because there could be 15, 16, 17, 18, 90, 20 blue vans. Therefore, that idea of making the hypothetical true. Whereas if we only had 10 vans, then there's no chance you can make the opposite true. There's no chance you can say, oh, OK, there's more blue vans than blue cars. OK, I hope that makes sense. And finally, there are more red cars than red vans. This one is going to be true um, because there's no red vans and we know that there's 15 red cars. OK, great. So two different styles of question. Um, hopefully you found that somewhat OK. And you can see I, I love this method so much because it's so versatile. Like you can put numbers in, you can put, um, you know, you can put numbers in. And the other one was like a lineage family tree. And you'll see the next one is slightly different. OK. And for any question, you can use this method and it just simplifies things so, so much. OK. Just allows you to see it much more easily and avoids you having to read multiple lines endlessly um, and, you know, over and over again. OK, so same again. Um, so what, what's going to happen here is I will, uh, if you guys would like to pause the video, have a go at this question, see if you can come up with some answers. OK, and when you unpause the video, um, I will go through it and um, you can see if your diagram and your answers matched up. OK. Perfect. OK, so let's go through this video then. So not all the people present at the literature festival were poets. So not all of them were poets. All of the poets were authors and some poets were not storytellers. OK, so that means that some poets must have been storytellers. OK, so. Let's have a look at this. So I think one important thing with the diagram is switching it around. So instead of saying some poets are not storytellers, you can say some poets are storytellers. OK, so let's go through this from top to bottom. 
And there's an important point that I want to illustrate here, which is often that questions, syllogism questions require, rely on what I call a central concept, which is an idea that often many of the questions are based around one key statement. So here it's going to be the fact that all poets are authors. You'll see what I mean. We'll come on to it. So let's have a look at the first question. At least one storyteller, the literature festival, was an author. Well, you can see all poets are authors and some poets are storytellers. So there is going to be a poet who is an author and a storyteller. OK, and therefore we can conclude that at, what, at least one storyteller at the Literature Festival was an author. OK, so based off the logic we just used, the second statement must also be true. At least one author was both a poet and a storyteller. Yes, because we just said there's a poet, there's an author and a storyteller. OK, let's go to the third one. All the authors at the Literature Festival were either poets or storytellers. So this is where we come back to that idea that I mentioned of all. So remember what I said, there's two easy ways to disprove an all statement. Either they are, an all statement is disproven if both of the variables given are false or if they're both true. So here, all the authors are either poets or storytellers or you can disprove it because what we can say is we previously in the line above, we literally just said at least one author is both. So we know that there is one author who is a poet and a storyteller. So when it says all the authors are either, that has to be wrong. OK, because we just said that there's at least one author who is a poet and a storyteller. So do you see how we've disproven this? So I guess this question, this statement is wrong for a multitude of reasons. So first of all, we've disproven it using the ors. And also because the fact it says all of the authors are either poets or storytellers, we know that's wrong because there's going to be at least one. OK, um, yeah. Cool. So. Therefore, this one has to be no. So what you can see is we've actually got three questions worth of answers for the price of one. We've got three for one here. And that's often sometimes the case with these syllogism questions. Like they are just the same question disguised. And that's an important concept to think about. Not all the authors at the Literature Festival who were poets were storytellers. Well, not all the authors who were poets. So remember, all poets are authors. So it's basically saying not all the authors who are poets. It's basically saying it's saying same as looking at the poets or authors and saying not all of them were storytellers we know that's true because only some of them were okay so it's true to say not all of them are so that's yes and finally all the storytellers who were poets were authors so this is a weird question it's not weird it's, it's, it's an important point to raise i could have got rid of rid of this first bit here i could have changed it to all the novelists all the dramatists i don't know whatever you want to call it at the literature festival who were poets or authors and this statement will still be true because this is the important idea who were poets were authors remember what do we know all poets are authors so when it says all the storytellers who were poets were authors like this bit technically doesn't matter that much this is the key idea who were poets were authors that must be true okay so all the storytellers who were poets were authors that must be true okay perfect so you can see three different styles of questions, and I'll go on to do some more um, in some of the follow-up videos. But this technique is really, really good, okay? Um, I would really highly recommend you do it because it just saves you from having to keep too much information in your brain. It displays it in a really, really easy format. And of course, with the varying styles of questions as well, it's important to be able to do lots of practice so that when you see the question, you kind of instinctively create the most efficient, um, most um, use, useful form of your diagram. Uh, obviously, I've had a lot of practice with this, but um, you can do these questions in 45 seconds. You know, it is possible. I know people often think syllogism questions have to take longer because they're two marks, but not necessarily. Um, but I hope that was a good um, introduction. And let me know in the comments what other questions you'd like to see and, and what other kind of videos or what other kind of topics you'd like me to go over. Thank you very much for listening.